By April, America and certainly all the G7 countries will be in recession. Employment is changing. Credit is getting tighter. Consumer loans are becoming problematic. And certainly if you look at Europe, it's pretty dark. And Japan is basically flatlining. The cushion's probably been put under the economy, but growth is going to be very muted. So all of that is happening at a time when political tensions are rising. Certainly in the Ukraine, but more mostly in the Middle East with the situation over Gaza. And I think there is a common thread between what Russia has been imposed on it by NATO and what Israel sees. It is both survivability as a sovereign state. That therefore means look for any quick solutions. So that's the short term. The next bit is that by probably by April, the Fed is forced to change its tack and the other G7 central bank by dropping interest rates and putting their feet on the on the cradle. That then will lead to the dollar falling sharply, inflation resurging, magnified by both food and energy prices soaring. So that as we get into 2025, we will see global inflation probably over 13%. Pocket will hate it. And having seen in the second quarter a drop in long term in the 10 year treasuries, we will see by the end of 2024, if not early 2025, US treasuries yielding well over 10%. What is that going to do to a highly leveraged? financial system globally. It will be a crash which will result in either seven years of rolling recessions or depression which will probably last about seven years and will be accompanied by conflicts within different countries if not civil war and wars between countries. And really the bottom line is pretty simple and that is that since at least 1991 perhaps even at the end of World War II America America's primary objective has been to dismember Russia and thus gain control of Russia's huge natural resources. And secondly, the development of BRICS produces risks to the dollar's domination of the world and thus uh, America's hegemonic status. So is America going to give up that powerful status or is it prepared to go to war to retain that situation? And that is really where we stand today. From the middle of next year, the middle of 2025, we will have what I call the last hurrah, which is that asset prices, equities and commodities will soar. And in fact, from the trough that we see by April, they will virtually off the commodity complex, the metals in particular, they will double in price and the same for equity. So that's okay. the last hurrah. That's the time to make money to survive the oncoming difficult periods. I've seen this coming for many years and each time we push it out a little bit further, but I think we've really got to the end of how many plays the central banks can play. They're reaching the end of their, their tether. The first sector that sees changes in economic activity are the copper rod mills and the copper alloy brass. They are the first step. So we started seeing a collapse in America and Europe, other parts of the world around May, June, say mid, mid this year. And the feedback that I was then getting was business was falling by 20, 30, 40 percent, depending on who. And yet the, the world seemed to be oblivious to what was happening in the real economy. And in China, um, in the first quarter, we saw a bit of a recovery. But since then, physical business has just turned south and almost many factories operating hand to mouth, accepting the few orders that come along, knowing they will lose money, but having to keep the factories open and the workers employed. Now what we're seeing is that people I talk to, no, we have not bottomed. We will 
probably bottom sometime in the next six months. As one said to me, you never know when you've bottomed until after the event. But physical business remains weak, remains weak in Europe, remains weak in, in America. No recovery seen. And in fact, the fabricators talking about a flat quarter of next year. So that fits my, my uh, forecast that we actually will see recession in most countries by April next year. I mean, everybody <laughs> within G7 countries. I think the opposite about China. I think China has been basing their financial strategy on the on the basis that the Western world is going to go into a mega economic and financial crisis, which is why they have not overstimulated their economy during the current weakness. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they will either. Very targeted stimulus, not like it has been historically. So what does that mean for currencies? It means, first of all, people of the dollar. So you'll get sterling, you'll get the euro and the yen, pretending that they're strong currencies. But it's only because money is flooding out of America into other currencies and where can they go? But eventually, when you get into the, the, the difficult period beyond 2025, then those currencies too will collapse. I think that <coughs> what we... What the policy of BRICS, obviously, <coughs> is de-dollarization. How are they going to achieve? The first step is much greater use of local currency. We've seen it in big deal, trade deal between UAE and India, all done in their own currencies. That's the first step. The second step is develop is the BRICS through the new development bank perfecting a BRICS currency. Whatever it might be called, some people say RRR, who knows. What will be the substance of that currency? My guess is that the BRICS currency will be backed by the bonds of the big BRICS countries, such as Russia and China. Those currencies, in turn, will be announced as being backed by gold. Not convertible, but back. Take China. China's gold reserves are north of 50,000, half of which is owned by households, financial institutions, bought from the Shanghai Gold Exchange since inception, I think it was in 2005. So they own <coughs> approximately 25,000 tons. And just recently was an arrangement made whereby households can buy gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange on the equivalent of a monthly stop order. So China turn around will, and, and the rest of the gold, 25,000 tons plus, is owned by different ministries, particularly the PLA. So one day China will turn around and say, our currency is backed by gold. Look how much the households own. And we've also got in the different ministries X, Y, and Z. Russia has north of 12,000. Where is that held? It's held in the company, and I forget the name, which sits, which sits above of the central bank. So you have two currencies backed by gold uh, whose bonds will then support the BRICS currency. So in effect, BRICS will move away fiat currency status into a currency directly or indirectly backed by gold. There's divisions, views between India and China. I think these divisions will be sorted out over time. I think there's a great that we need to come together. We're tired of being bullied by America and told what to do by NATO and the European. They've rejected all the peace offerings we've offered. So we have to create so our objective to create a national world to replace the world that's being dominated by America. And you are putting together, as you rightly say, nations that if not having enmity relationships have difficult relationships. But I think that the common cause is greater or will be greater than the disunity between countries. I suspect without knowing the <coughs> divisions between China and India. Really, India saying, we want an apology from you, China, for what you've been doing on our northern frontier. It's not yet being given, but I think at the right moment it will be given. And then they can sit down and have sensible discussion. Don't forget, India is also a member of SCO. So I think these are issues that time will resolve them. In our time frame, we don't have gold doubling. 
but we probably have gold going to between 2,500 to 3,000 by the end of 2025. Basically, long base metals, long oil, long equities. Quick what surge. happens is that manufacturing, instead of buying one widget, will buy two or three widgets as their hedge against a falling dollar and rising prices. Then the second part is the financial institutions, the funds, who historically, um, in such an environment, want physical things, physical metals, as well as futures. I mean, to tell a story back in the large inflation era of the 1975 to 1981, during that period, I had a large chemical company, American Chemical Company, as a client, told me after the event that they had actually bought 200,000 tons tons of physical copper, probably the equivalent of half a million today. We've got U.S. Treasuries yielding in the first quarter of next year at 5.7%, but then it collapses when the, the Fed and other central banks put their feet on the credit pedal to 3% in the second quarter. And as recovery comes in and inflation starts taking off, then yields, bond yields will be rising. This is all using 10-year Treasuries. U.S. Treasury. That's our benchmark. Yeah. I my my own view is it's better to own the physical rather than the shares of companies, which will also benefit. But I think that think you're moving into a world in half of next year where you want physical things and not paper things, despite the fact that paper will rise. I think by the time we get into the second half of the of of this decade, we'll be moving barter world. I think that China, Russia have been acting as restraining, excuse me, restraining forces. What's at stake is really as follows, in my view. What are October 7th did to them, to the psyche of Israel, is that we cannot live peacefully whilst there is a Palestine state, whilst there is the continuing threat from Hezbollah. If you look at a hidden agenda, not so hidden if I know about it, from America, which has been to create a second front war with Russia. How come? I listen <coughs> quite regularly to Israeli news channel 124. And there are frequent guys being interviewed, ex-intelligence services, ex-IDF, sometimes active. And there is always, it comes back to the central pivot, which is, it's Iran causing everything. And if Iran causes everything, it's Hezbollah and it's Hamas. So there is very definitely a feeling that we have to, first of all, eradicate Hezbollah. Problem is Hezbollah is not just located in Lebanon, but in Syria too. So if you start really attacking Syria, they've already basically knocked out Damascus's two airports. Then who bring who is brought into the war? Russia through the strategic alliance. So what does that then mean? <clears throat> the implication is that if Russia is brought in, then Iran comes in through its own forces to support Russia and China too. Now the accepted, the generally accepted view is that Iran is really an easy target, but it's not. According to the experts I listen, Iran some years ago switched from developing nuclear weaponry to developing advanced cruise missiles and hypersonic missiles, all of which they, they have now. In addition to which, acquired anti-ship missiles from both Russia and China. So any hit on Iran would be met with pretty devastating consequences, one of which would be the closure of the Hormuz Straits, through which at least 20% of the world's oil flows. That enough would create pandemonium in financial markets, since it would probably blow up trillions of derivative positions. So what is the likely outcome? I think the forces try to calm the, the waters in the area um, will succeed this year in preventing an accident happening and a big explosion in the area. I think also you, what has probably come out, particularly of the summit meeting in Riyadh last weekend and the current meeting 
of Muslim countries organized by China and, and BRICS is that there is only one solution, and that is a two-state solution. Problem with that is that Israel will never accept it, particularly after October 7th. So where do we go from here? The risks are so big that at some point, and I don't think it'll be this year, but some point, 2025, all hell is going to let loose. How big? Who knows? Look at the forces that America has put in place. An aircraft carrier fleet together with America's most sophisticated command and control ship off the coast of Israel. The SS Eisenhower aircraft fleet now in the Oman Sea. They're supposed to be there as a deterrent, but to the other side, they can be viewed as offensive weapons. So I'm not trying to present a very dire outcome. The risks are just massive and I'm not sure that America has the diplomatic skills to use diplomacy to create sense in a very complex and difficult situation. It's essentially what you are now building up is a world of Muslims, including Turkey, including China, including Russia, who have significant Muslim population versus the West. At some stage, there's going to be an accident that's going to trigger things. That's the big risk. All I'm saying is, I don't think we're there yet, but there's a big, big risk that by 30, in some form, and I suspect that all parties will agree, don't use nuclear weaponry. They don't have to, because they've got hypersonic technology. Probably by then, America's got it. The world is not going to be obliterated by nuclear weaponry.